Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir and worship team, for leading us uh, this morning. I know uh, what you're thinking right now is we've gotten over Corey leaving, but dang it, he's taking Wendy, right? Uh, and so I, I know, I realize that, but I appreciate your love and kindness towards her and her singing and all of your compliments along the uh, the time with us. Let me ask you to invite you to take out your Bible uh, and turn with me to First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four. And while you're turning there, I need to say a word of thank you to uh, the many uh, uh, of the folks who put yesterday together. There were lots of uh, wonderful ladies in our church that planned and organized and served our family yesterday in a wonderful and a warm reception. Uh, and I know many of you were able to come and say kind words and be uh, just a joy for us to celebrate our life together over the years. And so uh, thank you so much for that. And some of you have asked. And so just to be very clear with you on where we are and what's happening, um, we have today and, and next Sunday, I'll be with you as well. Uh, and then that will be our time of beginning to transition out uh, over the next uh, kind of end of March, figuring out where uh, we're going and where we're landing and all of that. Uh, and so um, we will uh, spend some time tonight. So I really want to encourage you to be at our members meeting tonight. I got to tell you, uh, over the last probably two weeks, I've had uh, a good bit of meetings with our staff and with your deacons. And man, they are uh, just impressive. The, the questions they're asking, the plans and the calendars and the things they're listing out and the prayers that they're voicing. Uh, I am uh, very, very, very thankful uh, in how the Lord has positioned the right people in our church to lead during this time of transition. And so uh, you're going to be able to, to follow and trust those men and, as they lead. And so tonight, we'll talk a little bit about that, of what that will look like for the church and uh, some of the, the people you'll be hearing from in the pulpit over the next couple of weeks. And so I invite you to make sure you're with us tonight in our members meeting. And next Sunday, uh, as my last Sunday with you, it's really kind of special. We're going to be celebrating baptism and the Lord's Supper together. So we're going to make much of Jesus and the gospel of, of Christ. And so we're excited about that uh, as well. Now, I've got two sermons left, today and next week. And so I got to just tell you, in two sermons, I can't preach the rest of Nehemiah. I know that you've been with me. We've started Nehemiah. We're four or five chapters in, and I don't want you to just be left in suspense, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you they finished the wall, okay? It gets built. Uh, the, they read the Word, and uh, in fact, I, I don't, I, like, it, it's really cool. You can read it yourself at home. That's how cool the Bible is, and so uh, they finished the wall. But because I have two sermons left, I was kind of thinking, well, what do I say, well, I don't want to necessarily go back through the road of how much I love you and let's just spend two Sundays crying. That, that's not good because your makeup starts running and then my nose starts running and you hear me in the microphone going <laughs> like that, you know, so we don't want to do that. And so what I want to do for two Sundays is I want to think about what would I say or what am I going to say to you, the church I love, and, and really just the idea of encouragement. And so for this Sunday and next Sunday, I, I want to just do a two-part series called Parting Words. And I want to say things to you that are encouragement. Now, I want, you to be, uh, I want you to relax. I've not been storing 11 years of grievances, I promise, all right? You're not, I'm not fixing to air them out. I, I made that joke yesterday to somebody. I said, boy, I got 11 years of things to say. And they looked at me and said, so do we. <laughs> I said, okay, so we're not going to do that, all right? So, so I want to just encourage you. I want to encourage you. I, I believe there are two uh, thoughts, two ideas, two truths that you should anchor, especially moving forward. The first one is simply this, you should be committed to the unity and the love of the church. You should be committed to one another. And the second one is simply this, and as a church, you should be committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that you are committed to one another and you are committed to proclaiming the gospel to the world. That those are the things that will anchor the church whatever season it may face. And so this morning, I want to take up that first thought, the commitment to one another, the idea of, of encouraging you uh, about how to be a church together. I, I hope uh, sometimes when you read the New Testament, you'll hear the Apostle Paul as he's writing a letter to a church saying, I, I've heard great things about you or the report was given to me. And so my heart's desire is over the next few months, as I hear reports about Elkdale and the things that are happening that one of the things that I hear is how well you are working 
together. How well you are serving together. How well you are unified as a church. And so in 1 Peter chapter 4, that's exactly what Peter does. He writes to the church, the kind of the church at large, and he says, this is the priority of a healthy church. This is what a healthy church should make its life about. This is how you hold together no matter the season. If you have your Bible open in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, this is a passage that over my time here we have visited several times and Today we will do it again because Peter gets right down to the the center core of, hey, hey church, this is what you should be about. This is the priority of the congregation. Look at what he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Love covers a multitude of sin. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each of you has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, uh, this morning as we think about the church, as we think about the body of believers that are gathered together, we think about this word, ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones that are saved by Christ and, and woven together into a family. Lord, I'm thankful that I stand here in front of this family, this family that's under the name of Elkdale. Lord, we know the church at large is all believers gathered and And we know, Father, that there are even in this city and this county and around us great churches that are gathering this morning. But for this congregation, for this one here, Lord, you have carved it out and made it special in its own way and given it gifts and talents and resources in order to do great things for you. And Lord, as this congregation binds together in a season of transition, Lord, we pray that That whatever they may face, whatever may come, whatever the ups and downs may be, we pray, Lord, that they will hear the words of Peter. They will heed the call of Scripture. And they will make sure to keep the priority of doing life together at the center of the church. So that they may make much of your name. So that Jesus may be proclaimed because he is worthy forever and ever. Lord, I pray this morning, as my heart is overflowing with affection for this great church, Lord, may we see from your word what it looks like, what we should do, how we should move forward, what is the priority of the church. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter will give us in this letter, I believe, four markers or four truths of a healthy church. What a church should look like. What are the priorities of a congregation? What you should be about every day of your life as you gather as a part of the family of Elkdale. Peter gives us this as he's nearing the end of his life. Most of the apostles were killed for preaching the gospel. We know John might have lived to old age, but the rest of them would have been, uh, their life would have been taken. Persecution would have been great. Even Peter, ourself, church history tells us, was killed for the name of Christ. And so we know as he writes, he writes as one that's burdened for the church because the church that he's writing to is facing not only wolves who would come in and preach a false gospel, but the persecution of the Roman society that was against them and the Jews who were twisting them into some occult, they were facing opposition on every direction. Listen, the next few months for you will be challenging, but the Lord is going to be good and provide and the church is extremely healthy. We are not in the setting that Peter's church was in. We are nowhere near what they were facing. But from this text, we can learn some things when we do face these moments of challenge. We can learn some truths that help the church. I want to give you four truths this morning, and I I would encourage you as members of the church, anchor yourself in these. Write them down. Think over them often. Make sure these are the priority of your heart as you continue to gather with this body of believers. Truth number one, a healthy church has an eternal perspective. A healthy church has an eternal perspective 
perspective. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 4. Peter says in verse, or excuse me, verse 7. Peter says in chapter 4, verse 7, look at what he writes. The end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Now, Peter is not a doomsday preacher. He's not standing on the corner and he's not mapped out the day and time that Jesus will return. He's not uh, telling you that somehow God will come back tomorrow. There is a pretty famous book that was written that said 99 reasons why Jesus will return in 1999. I don't know if you know this or not, but on New Year's Day of 2000, it fell through the market. It's not being per- That was kind of funny. You can laugh with me now. It's tough. Come on, work with me now. The idea is, is that, that no man knows the day or the hour or the time. We are not told ever, ever in Scripture to mark the moment when Jesus will return by some calendar date. We know that the Bible says the, that he will come like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when he comes. In the twinkling of an eye, the Lord will return. But what Peter is doing is he's looking at the church who's walking through a struggle, walking through a change, walking through a dilemma, walking through problems, and he looks at the church and he says, here is how the church will stay unified together. Keep your eye on the kingdom to come. Keep your eye on the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom that will come soon. Now, what do we mean by soon? Peter wrote these words some 2,000 years ago. That ain't real soon to us, is it? That's not soon to the society that puts our food in a microwave and goes through a drive through to get what we want for lunch quickly and move on. That's not soon for us. But when you think about the perspective of the time of God, when he returns will be real soon. Because all of the promises that were fulfilled in the Messiah, given in the Old Testament, were fulfilled in Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection brought to us the Messiah age. The Savior has come. And now theologians will say to us, we have entered into what is known as the church age. We are in the age of the church, the gathering of believers and the proclaiming of Christ. But in this church age, the only shoe left to drop is the return of Christ. The only shoe left to drop is the day of judgment. And so what Peter does is he looks at the church and he says, listen, above everything else, focus on the fact that any moment, at any time, the Lord Jesus may appear. That at any moment, at any time, the end is at hand. That it's close. In fact, Paul would write about this in Romans chapter 13, verse 11. He would say these words, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The Lord returning is nearer now than yesterday, and tomorrow it will be even closer. The idea is is that a healthy church keeps its eye on the fact that it is working towards an eternal kingdom and the king may appear at any moment. Now why is this important? Oh, let's just look at the last year. Uh, Over the last year, we had plenty of opportunities to get lost in the mire of this age. We had the political cycle that went on for nauseam that made us think about all the things that might be and might not be and and the debates that erupted in this worldly political society. And then we had this virus that scared us and hurt us and harmed us and and shattered our relationships and moved us apart. And, And I'm not mocking any of that. It's real. We have to live here and now. But what will happen is, is that next year something else will come along. And the next year something else will come along. And they're already telling us who's going to run for president in four more years, right? The the cycle keeps going and going and going. And before long, we as believers can find ourselves living from one current event to the next current event to the next current event. And we've lost our effectiveness because we've stopped thinking about the event when the Lord returns. And when the Lord returns, all of the current events that sucked up our time will mean nothing because the day of the Lord is at hand. And so, brothers and sisters, the priority of the church should be we are looking for Jesus and working until he appears. We have an eternal perspective. We have a a view for the things to come. You know what an eternal perspective perspective will do for a church? It'll keep a church from fighting over the color of the carpet. 
It, it'll keep a church from arguing over what time we should have the service or when we should have the service or what song we're going to sing this week. It'll, it'll keep a church from arguing over those kind of things because an eternal perspective will say we don't need to get all of our, our eggs in the basket of molehills when the mountain is that the Lord is returning. An eternal perspective will keep our feet moving forward knowing that we work for the return of the Lord. This is the call of Peter. Keep an eternal perspective. Truth number two, not only should you keep an eternal perspective, but a healthy church is eager to love one another. It's eager to love one another. Look with me at verse eight. He's just giving us clear instruction. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Sincere love covers a multitude of of sin. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Now, the Greek words here for earnestly and love literally mean eager, eagerly love. Work at loving. Be joyful at loving. Run into love when it comes to the church. Now, love has a lot of definitions in our world. Love is whatever ha- makes me happy. I want to do that for a while. Love is whatever causes butterflies in my stomach or sweaty palms along the way. That's love, right? We, we have lots of definitions for love in our world. And most of them, if not all of them, are self-centered, selfish definitions. The world definition of love is simply this. I love whatever makes me happy. And when it stops making me happy, I don't love it anymore. That's the definition of love. That's the self-centeredness of our love. I love this or that because it's brought me some sort of pleasure. But that's not the definition of love found in Scripture. The definition of love found in Scripture is always action towards other people. God is the definition of love. And how do we know God's love? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is love that a man would lay down his life for another. In the words of the great prophets DC talk, love is a verb. For those of you that didn't grow up in the 90s, DC talk was a Christian band. You should Google it. Love is a verb. It's about the idea that we do something for each other. And in fact, the text says, earnestly or eagerly love one another. It literally means trip over yourself to put somebody else first. Listen to the definition of love we find in Scripture. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know what I get tickled about when I read that. Most of the time you hear that passage of Scripture in wedding vows, right? You, you know, a couple gets married and they recite these words. And those poor kids getting married have no idea what these words mean, do they? Like you, you just think you know what you're talking about when you get married because everything's beautiful, the flowers are beautiful, the music beautiful, the dress is beautiful, the bride's beautiful, the groom is tolerable. And you get married and you say, I lo- love is patient. It's so kind. I will be with you for, we're never going to argue, right? And then somebody locked the keys in the car on the honeymoon and everything breaks loose. You understand when you read this that naturally this is not who we are. Naturally, we are not patient. Naturally, we are not kind to other people. Naturally, we do keep a record of wrong. We keep a scorecard. Naturally, we do make fun of wrong. We want people to fail so we can make fun of them and move ourselves up the ladder. Naturally, in our flesh, this is not who we are. But in the gospel of Christ, with Jesus living in us, this is who we should strive to be. And so he says to the church, live out this eagerly work at it trip over one another to love each other we know this is important because when jesus was asked what are the priorities of the king what are the top laws he would say love god and love your neighbor love people that that you serve people on the same way you serve god serve others john 13 Jesus would say it this way in John 13 35 he says by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another the church is marked by loving one another but I want you to notice something interesting here look at the verse 
I like the way Peter decides to pick out one part of love that, that the church needs to remember. Look what he says. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. So seek to love one another, work to love one another, uh, go after one another, meet the needs of one another. That's what it means. That's where it's at, right? But, but then notice what he says in that second part. Since love covers a multitude of sin. Now, I like that Peter decides that for his definition of love, he'll say it means forgiving or covering sin. Now, Peter is not somehow saying that your love in the church is atonement for sin. And he's not somehow saying that you can just run uh, uh, carte blanche into sinning because the church will forgive you and walk back and you live however you want to. That, that's not what he's saying. You know what he's really saying? I'm going to give you the practical down-home Dallas County English. He's saying everybody in the church is a mess. We are broken. We sin. We're fallen. We get angry. We get mad at each other. We're selfish. We fight. All of this is wrapped up in people doing life together. And you know what he says is most important? When you do all of that, you're going to sin against one another. And the best answer for sin is love each other. Think about those of you in the room who've had the privilege of being married for any amount of time. Think about how much uh, forgiveness and fortitude has to go into marriage. You have to keep going back and saying, I'm sorry. You have to keep going back and hugging and try again. You have to keep, some of you spent more money on makeup flowers than anybody I've known, right? You have to keep going back to this idea of, I'm sorry. I love you. Forgive me. And you know what the spouse that's been wrong has to do? Once again, offer forgiveness. Once again, hug them. And once again, go back to work at... Now, I'm not pointing out men or women here. Stop elbowing each other, all right? But the idea is, is that, that love covers sin. Love, forgiveness, kindness, patience covers the fact that we're a mess. Now, listen to me. In the days to come, your staff and deacons, they're going to be praying and trying to make decisions to lead this body. And you, as members, are going to be part of that. And everybody in this room has a thousand opinions. Everybody in this room has a thought or a way. And they're not all wrong. They're not all evil. They're not bad. We're all people. But remember this. Everybody's opinion is attached to a sinner that's a mess. And love will be the reason why we walk together through these moments. Love does this. The opposite of it is hate or strife. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, the great book of wisdom says this, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offense. Love, kindness, eagerly loving one another. This is the priority of the church. Think for a moment. If we loved one another in our failures and in our brokenness, how together the church would be. I mean, think about even our Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ loved those knucklehead disciples and they messed up all the time, but he kept breaking bread with them. He kept gathering with them. He kept uh, affirming them. Even when they deserted him on the worst night of eternity, when Jesus was crucified, what did he do after his resurrection? He gathered with them on the seashore and cooked them breakfast. He loved them. He cared for them. He covered their sins with affection. Oh, church, that you would do that. That I would hear of your perspective being eternal and your love for one another covering a multitude of sin. Truth number three from the text, the church that is healthy uh, will strive to maintain unity. Now, these all flow together. You can see that. Having love for one another will keep unity, but, but Peter fleshes his out. Look at verse 9. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one serves by the strength that God has supplied. Now, love in action is serving one another. Love in action is putting others in front of yourself. It's this idea of, of making sure we're striving to stay together, that we're fighting for unity again. You think about the analogy of the family, of, of husband and wife, of father and son, of mother and daughter, of, of just extended family. When you spend time with family over years, you are constantly fighting to stay unified. 
You are constantly fighting to stay together, to forgive one another, to love one another, to work through problems, to go ups and downs. Why? Because it takes work to stay unified. It takes work to love one another. So notice what Peter does. He lays out for us how a church holds unity. Here's how a church stays unified around an eternal perspective and a heart for love. Look at what he says. Look with me at verse 8. Excuse me, verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. The first thing he says when it comes to unity, he doesn't say doctrine, though that's the centerpiece of a church. They must have right doctrine, but he's writing to believers. He's writing to people that are already in the church. They've already confessed that they have right doctrine. They've already come into the body of Christ. So he's writing to them and saying, listen, if you want to hold unity, yes, stay with the truth. Keep the eternal perspective. He'll get to Jesus as his final command in a moment. But ultimately what he says is, in the nitty-gritty of the, day life of, of the daily life of the church, what you really got to work on to keep unified is, is that you're constantly serving one another. That you're constantly not putting yourself first. He says, show hospitality. Now, this is not just simply throwing a party with finger foods. That's not exactly what it means. It's part of it, but that's not exactly what it means. What he simply means is, is that you will take your resources and you will serve others in the church as they have need. You will meet the needs of others with what the Lord has given you. You will go out of your way to serve other people. Listen to me now. Hear me. In the next few months, you're going to be working towards finding the next man of God to lead you, and you're going to be walking through decisions, and the church will march on, and things will happen. And one of the greatest dangers is for you to put it into neutral and to just sit and wait and wait for the next pastor, the next leader, to wait for something else to happen, to wait for this or to wait for that. But, but Peter is writing to the church, and he says there's no neutral in the body of Christ. He said, every person should be committed to showing hospitality, to love to one another. And notice what he puts with hospitality, because this one's for Corey. And do it without grumbling. Right? Do it without grumbling. I'm very good at, at, at trying to serve other people, but I'm also very good at keeping score. Right? I'm very good at logging it in the back of my mind. Boy, they ain't done that. I've been doing this for years. They ain't done that. I've, I'm telling you, if we could get somebody this, 80% of the church is done by 20 cents of the people. You can keep score, right? You can keep score. I better quit now if I get in trouble. The idea is, is that, that you, can, you can move yourself into grumbling over service. And Peter says, when you serve one another, don't grumble. Don't, don't somehow think you're there. And, and, and let me show you why. Look, look at what he says about these gifts. He says a church that's unified will, will show this hospitality, but, but notice how it'll happen. It'll be through the gifts we begin. Look at what he says in verse 11. Whoever speaks as one of God speaks of oracles of God, and whoever serves as one serves as a strength by God's supplies. Now, now, what Peter is doing is he's just summing up spiritual gifts. He's not giving us two specific categories that there's only this gift and this gift. He, he's just simply serving them all up. And he said, look, there's two main roles in the church. There are those who teach and preach and lead by voice. And there are those who roll up their sleeves and do serving ministries and, and work in the gifts of, of getting the job done and things like that. And both of those are needed in the church. But notice with me what he says is the source of both of those gifts. Look there, verse 11. Whoever speaks as one speaks of oracles of God. It's God who calls the pastor to speak and strengthens the pastor. And get, It's God who informs the Sunday school teacher as he studies all week through God's Word. It's God who gives him the voice to teach the lesson. It's God who helps the preschool teacher work through the lesson and communicate it to little hearts and little minds. That's God doing that. And then he says here in verse 11, And whoever serves, serves by the strength of God's supply. It's God who gives the ladies the hands to put the little finger foods out at the reception. It's God who gives the deacon the back to move the table when it's time to set the table up. It's God who places the ushers in place in order that they may carry out the gathering of the offerings. He's simply saying, when you serve the Lord, remember, you're only doing it because God is letting you and empowering you to do that. And so he says, here's how you hold unity in the church. You show each other hospitality with the gifts you've been given. You use your gift to serve everybody else. And when you use your gift to serve everybody else, you don't grumble or keep score. You remember you're only able to do this because God's been good to you. Because God has given you what you need in order to help other people. In fact, he says in there, by varied grace. That means the Lord scatters gifts all over the place. 
He gives everyone in the church a, a role to play. When you come to Christ and the Holy Spirit has changed your heart, you've been given spiritual gifts, you also have natural abilities and talents, and all of those are for the body of Christ. Listen now, this is truth from the Scripture. When you join a local church, it is God's design for you to serve in that local church. One writer put it this way. He said, sometimes the church looks like a football game. 85,000 people needing exercise while 22 people do the exercise. It's for all of us. It's for all of us to join in and serve one another. I hope, I hope that in a few weeks or a few months when I'm speaking to some of you and I'm calling and checking, when I'm uh, talking to my friends, I hope I hear, Pastor Man, you ought to believe how people are serving. You ought to hear how so-and-so stepped up. Man, I never expected that from her or him. Look how they're doing this or filling in that gap or or leading in that way. I, I hope you will take serious the call to hold unity by serving one another. We are meant in the church not to be consumers, but contributors. We are to be a part of it. One writer put it this way. He said, we're all knots in the net God has thrown over the world. We're all knots in the net that God has thrown over the world. We're all in this fishing together for the Lord's kingdom and his work. Oh, that we would do that together. Let me give you a fourth and final truth to hold to unity, to be healthy. This is where we'll close this, this morning. Look with me at the second part of verse 11. He says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. A healthy church labors to make much of Christ. A healthy church labors to make much of Christ. They have an eternal perspective. They are eager to love one another. They are working for unity by serving one another, by using their gifts. But ultimately, Peter gives us this path of a healthy church leading all the way to the culmination saying, and the mark of a healthy church is that they desire for God to get the glory through Jesus Christ. That a mark of a healthy church is that they make much of Christ because he is worthy, and notice what he says, of glory and dominion forever and ever and ever. You notice how he puts those words forever and ever. That's just not because he's ending a cool song and needs to figure out a tagline. He's making sure we understand there is never a day where Jesus doesn't deserve glory. And there will be never a moment where he should be taken from our minds, uh, attention, and our hearts, affection. Jesus must always be the center of the gathered church he and he alone is worthy of glory would you do me a favor take your bible and turn to colossians chapter one we'll finish this morning by seeing jesus again why should the church make much of jesus look at colossians chapter one starting in verse 15 i just want to read to you what paul has to say about jesus I want you to just be saturated this morning with why Jesus must be the center of the church, why he must be the the voice of the church, he must be the the passion of the church. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. I'm going to read through verse 22. He's describing Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things are held together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy 
and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus is to be the center of the church. Why? Because he is God. He is creator. He is sustainer. He is the centerpiece of all things. He holds all things together. There is no one like him. There will never be anyone like him. He is the first to be resurrected from the dead. And because he's been resurrected from the dead, we too shall be resurrected from the dead. And we will be gathered up with him forever. And notice what he says there in verse 20 and 20. 21 and 22. We were once separated from God, alienated, and he made peace with God. How? Not because he just overlooked it, not because he may wave some magic wand, not because he just said you're forgiven. He made peace by dying on the cross, shedding his precious blood, the very blood of heaven poured out so that you might be redeemed, so that we might be redeemed, so that we might be together in the church. Jesus himself, the preeminent one, the glorious Savior, the Alpha and the Omega, has died so that we might be brought into a family and when the church is healthy and the church is successful it will make much of Jesus for he is worthy he and he alone is worthy Friends, you are not looking for the next pastor that can craft a good sermon. You are not looking for the next pastor's wife that can sing a good song. You are looking for someone who will walk hand in hand with you and say, Jesus is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of the church's affection. He is worthy of your affection. He is worthy of all that and more because he has brought us into the kingdom of God through the blood of the cross. Jesus is worthy. And notice verse 22, what he has done for us. He has reconciled us by his death, and now he presents us holy and blameless and above reproach. Not only has he saved us, he's washed us and secured us so that now when we draw our last breath or that day when the Lord returns, we will be welcomed into the kingdom, not because we deserve it or we've done anything good, but because he has washed us clean. Oh, I love the way we sang it earlier. Thank you, Jesus, for he has saved us. This church is not about the building or the nursery or the music. It's not about the pastor or the sermon. The church is not about the time we meet or the tithes we collect. The church is about Christ. He is worthy. And a healthy church, a church that is committed to the things of God, will remember in all things Christ. St. Patrick, the apostle of Ireland who planted churches hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago, wrote this in a famous poem. He said, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lay down, and Christ when I sit down, and Christ when I rise. In the old spiritual, it would say something like this. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone. He is worthy. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Lord, we are reminded... That life with Christ is full of endless hope. That the church who has Christ has hope. That the, the marriage who has Christ has hope. That the family that has Christ has hope. That Christ is the creator, the sustainer. He holds all things together. But Lord, we are also reminded that to be without Christ is to be hopeless. A church that's not focused on Christ is aimless and without hope. A marriage not focused on Christ is full of strife and without hope. A person who doesn't have Christ is without hope. For Christ is preeminent over all. God, I pray that we as believers gathered in the church, would make much of Christ. Lord, I pray in the days to come over this congregation 
that they will hold to unity, that they will have the marks of a healthy church, that they will be consumed with the fact that any moment you might return and they want to be found faithful. They will be overjoyed to eagerly love one another and fight for unity. And above all, they would make much of Christ. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. I, I offer you an invitation this morning, a chance to respond. Maybe you're here and, and quite honestly, you've just not been focusing on Christ. He doesn't control your decisions. He's not part of your prayer life. He doesn't order your steps. And you want to come this morning and say, Pastor, I need Christ to be the head over me. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're a lost person. You don't have Jesus as your Savior. You're not sure about the day of judgment when He returns. You don't know what will happen when you die. And brother, sister, today can be the day of salvation, for Christ is salvation. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I, Pastor, I, I love the church, but I, I've not been real committed. I've kind of been half-hearted, and I know walking into this new season, the church, is, the church needs me to be part of the team. You want to come this morning and just say, I, I'm ready to serve. I, I want to be in. Pray for me. Maybe you want to come into this altar and pray that, that this church would hold unity, that it would eagerly love one another. Whatever the case may be, I, I pray in just a moment as we stand and sing, you would respond to the Lord in a way that would please Him. Father, bless our time as we uh, sing to you and respond to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing?